Hello, everyone. Finally, after more than a year of development, this is the latest and greatest of the Positron 3D printer series, the Positron Virgin 3. This is an upside-down, compact, super-fast, and portable 3D printer. This video is split into two parts. In the first part, I will introduce the Positron Virgin 3 and all its features. In the second part, I will tell you the design story of the Positron series and how everything got started from beginning to the present time. And please stick around until the end of the video for an important announcement. So let's see what the Positron version 3 can do. The entire printer fits inside a 1kg filament spool box and can be easily carried around to wherever you want. And when you are there, from being packed fully inside a box to set up. It only takes one minute. Now, in my previous video, I showed that Positron version 1 had at least double the build volume of similar 3D printers. Well, what if I told you that Positron version 3 has almost 1.7 times the build volume compared to even Positron version 1? Thus, with a build volume of 180 by 185 by 180 millimeters. Positron version 3 is easily one of the most compact 3D printer designs. Positron version 3 is also the lightest of the Positron series, weighing in at just 2.7 kilograms, or the weight of a generic gaming laptop. Being so lightweight and portable, some of you might think that this printer might be slow and not rigid. But this is precisely the opposite. Positron version 3 is three times as fast compared to traditional Cartesian 3D printers. It can print at 250 millimeters per second, travel at 400 millimeters per second, and its acceleration is 1G or 9.8 meters per second squared. It achieves all these impressive specs because of three high level design decisions. Number one, its upside down nature means that the center of mass is always down and low, so there isn't any need for frame to support the gantry. And Positron version 3 actually has the lowest center of gravity compared to its predecessors. Number two, a all new hot end design together with a bowling extruder makes the hot end extremely light, so it can be moved around at high speeds. Number three, a custom cable-driven cross-shaped H-belt gantry with cross-linear rails. This design decouples the motor's mass from the X and Y axes, thus reducing inertia. Speaking of the gantry, instead of using belts, Positron version 3 kinematics uses these special synchromesh cables. What's special about these cables is that it allows the drive plane to be switched at will. Unlike basically all other 3D printers, the Positron series all features a 90 degree hot end, and as I will show later, this has no effect on build quality. And as a plus of this 5th generation design, it actually allowed me to improve the efficiency of the hot end drastically, so now it is basically on par with an E3D volcano in terms of flow rate. One of the coolest features of the Positron series is the transparent heated build plate which you can look through and see exactly how your first layer is being laid down. There's also automatic bed leveling, so there is no need to adjust screws each time the printer is folded and unfolded. These two features together make sure that the first layer is laid down perfectly every time. Additionally, the build plate is also MagSafe, so it can be easily removed or secured in place. Positron version 3 is running one of the best 3D printer firmware, the Clipper firmware. The printer features a full-color touchscreen and has Wi-Fi built-in. It could connect to your home Wi-Fi, or if you are out and about, it broadcasts its own Wi-Fi signal. So you can control, upload, and manage prints anywhere within the vicinity of the printer. Finally, as usual, Positron version 3 has RGB built-in for printing in the dark, as well as four status indicators. That's basically all the high-level feature of the Positron version 3. And let's see its print quality. If you have seen the previous video on Positron version 1, 
you will see that printing upside down actually has no effect on printing quality. And Positron version 3 is the same as well. The major difference is that Positron version 3 now has dual cooling fans. This produces better overhang and bridging performance at higher speeds. Just to illustrate the point, I designed this 120mm bridging test and Positron version 3 handles it without any problems. In terms of tolerance, this printer managed to clear all the way down to 0.2mm, which is on par with other printers. Thus, printing place models work flawlessly. Overhangs? They work up to 70 degrees. Supports are printable and easily removable too. Both organic and geometric shapes work extremely well on this printer. As a challenge, I also printed this lattice torture test, which also worked without any problems. The Positron series is designed for rapid prototyping in both PLA and PETG. The build plate goes up to 90 degrees Celsius and the hardened goes up to 250. It handles these filaments extremely well. Because it is printing upside down, many of you could be worried about bed adhesion. However, bed adhesion is a non-issue because the bed uses borosilicate glass as its material. When hot, the intermolecular forces between the print and the glass makes the print adhere strongly to the bed, and the prints automatically pop off the bed when the bed is cooled due to differences in thermal expansion. As a final note on print quality, I printed an all-in-one print quality test, and this is the quality compared to my Prusa i3. As you can see, both printers can produce excellent results. Positron version 3 has now over 500 hours on record, and it has been my daily printer as I have to frequently travel between cities to attend classes. And even though there is a bunch of Prusa printers in the university shop, I still brought Positron as it allowed me and my team to go through multiple iterations of design because it can print so fast. And that is Positron version 3, a compact, fast, and portable 3D printer. It took over a year of work and three redesigns to get to this point. And so the second part of the video is about the development history of the Positron series and everything it took to get to this point. But before that, let me tell you about the sponsor of this video, JLC PCB, from whom you can get five high quality PCBs for just $2. And now, all three versions of Positron uses PCBs from JLC PCB. It is easy to create schematics and convert them into boards using their free online editor, Easy EDA. The PCBs generally gets to me in just 5 days, so I can go through multiple revisions to fine tune the design. Check them out in the link at the description. Now, here is the full design history of the Positron series, which you will see how design choices are made and evolve. As you may have known, I don't usually present the progress of my projects, only the final result. So please let me know in the comments if you like this segment. So let's begin. The initial idea for this product came from me just getting tired of Cartesian 3D printer design. Don't get me wrong, this design was great in 2011 and still good in 2018 when Creality introduced the Ender 3. But nowadays, it seems like every printer is an Ender 3 clone and overall lacks innovation. So I want to create a printer that can print much faster and it is a lot more unique in design. I started by doing research of a lot of core XY designs, as well as winch-driven mechanisms. It is during this research that I had an idea to 3D print upside down. Because if you flip a core XY 3D printer upside down, all the heavy moving mass is near the bottom and there is no longer a requirement for a heavy frame. And furthermore, this drastically reduces on the vibrations of this printer. As you can see in this video by CNC Kitchen, when the print head is very high, it induces more vibration into the 3D printer frame. So I initially planned 
for just a traditional upside down printer with a Core XY gantry. However, this is when I found this design by Lobo CNC when he made an upside down 3D printer that is mounted onto a granite plate. His design gave me a lot of inspiration and I started sketching for ideas. During this process, I made two major realizations. Number one, the gantry does not need to be mounted perpendicularly with the base. It could be mounted diagonally and this can reduce the overall footprint of the design. And also, if I can find a way to get rid of the belt twisting issue, I can make a gantry that is a lot more compact and last a lot longer. This is when I found something called the Synchromesh cable, which it advertises as being able to change the drive plane at will. I was initially skeptical about its usage, but then I found a video of someone putting this on a 3D printer and it looks like it functions just fine. These realizations, together with several iterations of the drawing, evolved into a compact, small, and foldable 3D printer idea. The next step is to determine the build volume of this printer. For this, I went through almost all my 3D printed models in the past two years, and I realized 95% of them fit inside a 180mm3 build volume. Then, with some rough layout in CAD, I found that it is possible to fit the entire gantry into a 200 by 200 millimeter bounding square, which is also conveniently the size of most filament spool boxes. With that, I wrote down a simple list of all the requirements. Overall, the 3D printer consists of four major subsystems, the hot end, the extruder, the kinematics for the X and Y axes, and the Z axis. In the beginning, I was not certain that the kinematics would work at all and be accurate, so I tried to test it out first. The initial model was very rough. It is just some laser cut pieces of wood, together with some 3D printed components. And to my surprise, the kinematics works just fine and it was reasonably accurate, even with all the janky components. The next step is to test out the 90 degree hot end. Because of how flat the machine needs to be, there isn't enough space to fit a traditional hot end. So the filament has to take a 90 degree turn. My first revision was very rough. It was just an aluminum block with drilled and press fit tube. The other side is threaded for the nozzle and the two holes met in the center in the 90 degree angle. This design is pretty bad. Because there is just too much space inside the block and this causes highly inconsistent extrusions. After another two revisions, I made a drastic change to the design of the hot end. The change is the addition of a brass insert. This change allowed the ease of manufacturing as there is no more body mean tap required. And also this design allowed the use of traditional heat breaks and both the nozzle and the heat break can be sealed against the brass insert to create a constrained filament path. This design was a lot more successful than the previous versions and it achieved a similar flow rate as an E3D V6 at 12 cubic millimeters per second. With both the kinematics and the hot end design validated, I went on to design the extruder. Back then, I was fixated in the highest amount of torque in the smallest package. So I went with a warm gear design and paired it with a NEMA 11 stepper motor. This resulted in a small extruder with very high push forces. However, in hindsight, using warm gears is a bad idea, as I will explain later. For the Z-axis, this is what I spend most of my time on because it has to be folded and compact. It also has to be very rigid. Many designs were tried, but I eventually settled on a warm gear driven belt design. And the Z-axis is detachable through some screws and the motion is coupled using a spider coupler. And the warm gear was chosen mainly because that's what I already have on hand 
and I felt that would simplify things. The next major task is to find a way to heat up a transparent heated build plate. The build plate had to be transparent because otherwise it would be very difficult to see what the printer is doing. And I want the printer to come with great user experience too. Initially, I was looking at indium tin oxide glass, which is a type of coating on glass that makes it electrically conductive. The only problem was the price. So I looked at another source of heated glass, and that is a car's rear windshield. Fortunately, I found a company that sells these heater strips as DIY kits. So I bought a few of those, calculated the resistance of the strips, and laid them out in a densely packed pattern on a piece of borosilicate glass. And the result was actually quite decent. And from the thermal camera, the temperature looked quite stable as well. For bed leveling, since this printer is going to get folded a lot and transported, automatic bed leveling is basically a necessity for this design. So I selected this IR probe. It actually works pretty well on glass, and it is one of the smallest and most low profile of bed sensors. Now, with all these subsystems validated, I basically delved into a CAD for the next three weeks trying to integrate everything. For the control board, I basically have no choice but to buy the smallest control board that is available at the time, which is the SKR Mini E3. Even then, with the design, I had to remove a lot of headers and connectors as they are interfering with the internal geometry. Each step of the way, I would try to 3D print the component and try to place them to see if they work together. If not, it is just a cycle of going back, revising the design. In the end, I ended up with over 10 major revisions. And I got to a point where the printer finally made its first prints. I was happy at the time as I got to anything to work at all. But the quality is terrible. So I went on to diagnose the issues and made more revisions to the design. After more tests, I got to a point where I feel confident to make the final prototype. Then it is time to start making modification to the board, 3D printing various components, and all the machining and sheet metal bending. Eventually, after around 30 hours of assembly time, the printer was finally complete. And it generated some very good prints. You can see the printing quality in the Positron version 1 intro video. After I posted the video, it was way more successful than I thought. Even large 3D printer channels recognize my design which I am really grateful of. And I started to film the Positron version 1 build series almost immediately. However, when I was editing the footage and writing the script, I realized that the design is still heavily flawed in many aspects, even though it generated some very good results. Number one, the amount of modifications that needed to be done to the mainboard made the assembly process extremely tedious. Second, the warm gear turned out to be a really bad choice for both the Z and the extruder. At that time, I didn't really know that linear advance, which is a setting that compensates for the changing pressure inside the nozzle, made the extruder make sudden rapid movements, which makes the extruder to skip steps anytime the printer is printing faster than 125 millimeters per second during corners. The warm gear on the Z axis is not really any better as I realized that these cheap Chinese worm gears produced quite a lot of Z-banding on the prints. This resulted in me in having to buy a $35 worm gear from McMaster car. Worst of all, after 300 hours of printing, there is noticeable wear on the worm gears. Furthermore, I couldn't really achieve all of the objectives I set out to do. Even though the printer does fit inside a filament spool box, I needed to find the largest filament spool box available to do so. 
the build volume turned out to be a lot smaller than 180 millimeters cubed. Together with the painfully small screen and the very flimsy build plate, I decided against on making a build series for Positron version 1. This is because I do not want to launch an inferior product. I do not want anyone wasting their time building Positron version 1 only for Positron version 2 to come out a few months later that is much better. So I began designing the version 2. My main objectives are pretty simple. Solve all the design problems of Positron version 1 and make it much faster, being able to complete a benchy in under 15 minutes. And also to simplify production and assembly. And here is the CAD of the version 2. I will highlight all the major design changes. Number 1. I got rid of all the worm gears. For extruder, it is a belted design with a 3 to 1 gear reduction ratio, driven by a Pancake NEMA 17 motor. This change made the rapid movement of the linear advance and retractions much smoother and faster. For the Z-axis, I went with a lead screw driven design and a vertical coupler that is much easier to align and place. The complexity of the Z-axis is reduced dramatically as I ditched the dual linear rail design in favor of a single wide linear rail. To solve the flimsy bed problem, instead of having foldable arms that comes out to hold the bed, I went with extrusions attached by thumb screws. This gives the bed a lot more vertical rigidity and the kinematics is also changed. In version 1, the motors are offset from the center of the printer, and they took up quite a lot of space. To be more space efficient, I placed the motors at the two extremes of the printer, and folded the gantry on top of itself. This made it so that on each motor, there is one drive pulley and one idler pulley. Another major change was the hot end. Instead of having the heating cartridge right next to the brass insert, now the heater cartridge is inserted perpendicularly into the brass insert. The main advantage of this design is that the most critical part of the filament path is the bend, and that bend is now only 2 millimeters away from the heater cartridge. This simple design change actually doubled the performance of the hot end compared to Positron version 1 and now the flow rate is comparable to E3D Volcano. For the build plate, I used JLC PCB service to make jumpers for all the heating strips. And furthermore, inside the PCB, I also incorporated heaters to compensate for the edge losing more thermal energy compared to the center. For the controls, I found the clipper screen project, and I also saw that the 3.5 inch TFT can be used. So I bought it, and it has been working out great, as it is just the right size for the printer. So after another two months of designing and building, the Positron version 2 was born, and it is a lot more capable than Positron version 1. I originally hoped to print a Benchy in under 15 minutes. However, with some tuning, I was able to get it under 10 minutes. From a pure functional standpoint, Positron V2 was great. It produced way more reliable prints than the Positron version 1. It is also around 2.5 times faster. Now, the last step before releasing the design is user testing, which did not go so well. Long story short, I think I became set on improving the performance and the build volume to the required size, and I had to sacrifice many other aspects of the design. The main problem is that now there is too many thumb screws, and the Z-axis lead screw was extremely finicky to install and to take apart. The design is just overall too complex. This increased the assembly time to above 3 minutes, which to me it was unacceptable. Also, throughout the calculations, I left a safety factor of 5, and this resulted in an extremely rigid design. However, now the design no longer fits inside a normal filament spool box, and I needed a rather large 3 kg spool box to hold the printer. The weight now is also increased to 4.6 kg, 
which is almost double of Positron version 1, and it was noticeably heavy inside the backpack. And indeed, I got some very negative feedbacks from my fellow designers regarding the portability and the ease of use of the machine. After user feedback, I had to make a very difficult decision, either to launch Positron version 2 as it is, which it has very good performance but bad usability, or go back to the drawing board and make Positron version 3. By this time, I had spent more than 1000 hours and thousands of dollars of material costs, and looking back at the original specifications for my design, I wondered if they are possible at all. I was very close to start making Positron version 2 intro video. However, this is when I saw a new 3D printer control board called the XKR Pico. This is by far the smallest commercial 3D printer control board I have ever seen. And with its small size, I realized that I can make things work potentially. So I started again laying things out in CAD and also looking back at the design decisions I made for version 1 and version 2. And I tried to select the best aspects of both revisions and together incorporate them with some new features. So I started the design for Positron version 3. For this design, I really want to come up with a solution that both looks aesthetically pleasing and functions well. Long story short again, here are all the major changes I made to the Positron version 3. The Z-axis is now driven by a NEMA 14 motor with a 3 to 1 gear reduction with belts. Not only this gets rid of the Z-bending problem, it also solves the torque issue. In the previous versions, the power is transferred to the build plate by copper strips on the side. This system works okay, but because of the exposed copper strips, it can happen that the bed can short out with a printer frame during removal. In fact, this happened to me on Positron version 1 and burnt out the entire control board. So for version 3, I found this MagSafe connector and it has special magnets inside that can handle high temperatures and it is very convenient to insert and remove the build plate. Because there is no longer a need to run wires through the Z-axis arms, the Z-axis arm can be machined out of a single piece of aluminum and it is simple and solid. The next major change is the extruder. Now it is using a compact cylindrical NEMA 14 motor with BMG drive gears for a 5 to 1 gear reduction. The design is also very compact and gives plenty of torque. Because of all the weight savings on the tool head and the X axis, I was able to get away with pancake NEMA 17 motors while still maintaining a theoretical max acceleration of 12,000 mm per second squared and a travel speed of 500 mm per second. There are also some miscellaneous changes, such as because of the chip shortage, Raspberry Pis are hard to come by, so I designed a computer compartment to be compatible with both Raspberry Pi 3, 4, and the Pi 02W. It is also compatible theoretically with the Orange Pi H2, if you are willing to go through some hassle to make the screen work. Speaking of the screen, it is now mounted by a front connector. This gets rid of the finicky ribbon cable on Positron version 1 and 2. With all the changes and revisions, Positron version 3 was finally able to achieve and exceed all my objectives. Positron version 3 now takes only 60 seconds to deploy, and with its folded height of only 75 millimeters, it fits inside almost all standard filament spool boxes I have. Its print quality is on par with some of the best machines on the market. And overall, I am glad that I decided to go with version 3. And after all of this talk, I hope you will agree with me as well. Before I show you a printing montage of the Positron 3D printers, I would like to make an important announcement. You might be wondering, when is the Positron build series coming? And I promise that it is coming soon. However, due to personal reasons, which I cannot disclose here, 
I cannot manufacture positron 3D printers in the foreseeable future. But this is where the good news is. I will release the entirety of the design, the CAD, the build of materials, the production files, the PCB design files, the schematic, the printer configuration, as well as Kira slicer configuration, all to public under the Creative Commons license. This means that any one group or company may manufacture and sell this product as long as you credit Krillin as the inventor somewhere visibly on your product. Basically, I wish to break the cycle of copying and lack of innovation in the desktop FDM 3D printer space. So this is why I am basically releasing this design for free. This is my gift to the 3D printing community. If you like what I do, please consider subscribing to my channel and share this video. I realized on this channel when I usually develop something, it usually takes me several months to do so. And only if the product works do I show the final results. This often leaves a huge gap in my upload schedule. And I realized this is not the best way to keep all of you updated on what I'm thinking and doing. So this is why I'm excited to announce that from now on, I will be on Patreon where you can support my channel and see frequent updates on behind the scenes stuff as well as the projects I am working on. Please consider becoming a member of my Patreon. I would gladly welcome any support as it enables me to continue to create awesome designs and release them for free. And I guess that's all for the Positron version 3 intro and the story of the Positron series. If you have any questions, please ask away in the comment section. And now, for the montage.